Hello, everyone, and welcome to Paula's Soapbox Live. My guest tonight you have seen in numerous commercials. She's also been in numerous daytime television series, including Sunset Beach, uh, The Young and the Restless, Passions, One Life to Live, and most notably, The Bold and the Beautiful. She has a book, and it is called Breaking the Perfect Ten. And this is basically her testimony. This is her journey that ultimately led her to Christianity and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. She stars in a new movie that opens in theaters next week on March 20th. It's called Do You Believe? And it's from the creators of God's Not Dead. Take a look. Hi. Kyle. Welcome to the show, Tracy Melchior. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry you had so much trouble logging in, though. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I I am that person. Like I said, I'm like kryptonite to technology. I break it down. <laughs> well, this is new technology for everyone, so don't feel bad. <laughs> Something I didn't know about you is that you were a hockey commentator. I was briefly, yeah. I did it I one season. That. Anaheim Ducks. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, yeah, you were a hockey commentator, so how did you get involved with that? You know what, I um, we we're big hockey fans. My son plays oh. for the Junior Ducks, which the Ducks hockey team is really close to us, so they you know practice at the Ducks training center and everything. We go to a lot of games, and I was noticing we went and um, when the Ducks played the Kings, they had this girl Heidi Andrell on, and she was so good, and she was kind of younger and hipper than most sports commentators, and um, and she's a brunette girl, and I was I went up to the um, president of the Ducks when I saw him at a game one time and I said, you know that Heidi Andral, she sure makes the broadcast interesting. I think the Ducks need a blonde version of her and I'd like to throw my hat in the ring for that. And uh, from that, um, it kind of sparked everything and then my son's hockey coach used to, or was playing for the Ducks at the time and um, he put in a good word for me and it just kind of all snowballed into that. Wow. So you um, just you just went for it. You wanted to do it, and you just went for it. Yeah, that's what I do. I, yeah. I, I'm like a dog after a bone. If I get an idea that I want to do something, it's it's kind of, I don't see obstacles. I just, I am a prize. You just have to do it, yeah. That's really good. Well, I know you got your, your SAG card for uh, doing an Old Spice commercial, and that's actually, mm -hmm. that's actually, <laughs> we're still experiencing some sound issues, um, but that's actually an interesting story. Because you weren't supposed to be the lead in that commercial. You were like the stunt double. Yeah, see, that kind of good fortune doesn't always happen to me. Right, so that was yeah. Like this story, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I was happy to get the job because it got me in the union, so that was good. Right. Um, part of me was like, oh, but I'm so close. And, you know, it's like we're never happy, right? We always want more. So I'm like, it's right. good that I'm the stunt double. I'm getting in the union, I'm getting paid, all that, but why can't I be her? And uh, it was kind of a funny story because the makeup artist, he started putting makeup on me. And when you're the stunt double, they can't see your face because you're wow. supposed to be you. 
And I said, no, 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 you can't put makeup on me. I'm a stunt double. And he's like, what? You're the double? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, okay. And next thing I know, they're trying to match my hair to the actress's hair. And the walkie-talkie comes in, and it's the director. And they're saying, hey, can you get the stunt double out here? The actress she can't get the horse to run. And um, we need to set up this shot. So I go out there, and I grew up on a horse ranch. been riding my whole life, and I used to ride bareback a lot. And um, so the show off that I am, I just, I get on, you know, they're like, need a leg up. I'm like, no, because I can swing up from the main. So I mm -hmm. swing up, I just take off. And they're like, whoa, slow down. Okay, yeah, the horse will run. It's not the horse. Right, and, the actress. And, yeah. Well, she's <laughs> doing the thing that a lot of people do when they're scared. Um, right. Metaphorically in life, but on real horses, too, is you kind of pull the reins back while you're kicking them because you don't really want them to run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, next thing I knew, I'm back in the makeup chair, and he's doing my makeup. And I go, Cochise, he's a full-blooded Indian guy. And uh, I said, like I said, I can't do my makeup. They're not going to see me. And he goes, no, girl, see that bus? They're taking her home. You just got the commercial. <laughs> they decided, why try and match her? And um, so that was my first entry into the Screen Actors Guild. That's that's an awesome story that, I mean, not only that you got in that commercial, but that you got your SAG card from that commercial. So it was just like good fortune just, just happened. It was, and it was cool that horses got me there because that's such a huge part of my, my life and growing yeah. up. But I tell you, because I hadn't been riding regularly because I didn't have a horse out in California, mm -hmm. and I was riding probably eight hours that day, and, you know, when you ride bareback, it's all leg muscles holding you in. I yeah. could really walk. <laughs> My thighs were exhausted. They were like spaghetti that night. And then the next day I was like, oh. oh like sore. <laughs> it was only one shooting day. I wouldn't have yeah. never lost. That's pretty cool, though. So do you, um, you still ride horses now. I do. You know, right after that, I called my mom. I said, you need to send me a horse. Yeah. I could I need a horse to maintain this skill. And yeah. she sent me my uh, mare that I'd had since I was 12 years old. And right now I own her son and her granddaughter are the oh, two wow. horses. Oh, wow. So they're, so they're are your kids involved in the riding the horses now too? Well, of course not. I have two boys and neither <laughs> one could really care less. Really? <laughs> yeah, it kind of stinks. Yeah. That's surprising. So do you do still do the country dancing too? That I don't get to do very much just because, you know, I have two young kids and that's usually a bar scene to go right. country dancing and right. you know, married and it's it's kinda hard to find a way to still do that. But Yeah. Yeah. Well that's that's actually how you met your husband, they're right. You're yeah. you're going to country dancing and he happened to be there. I've met both my husband's country dancing. <laughs> That's right, because that was in your book, so. <laughs> so perhaps, yeah, maybe that's why my husband doesn't want me going. <laughs> he doesn't want me to meet my third husband. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, one of your most notable roles was um, on The Bold and Beautiful as a Kristen, a Kristen Forrester Dominguez. Um, so in this role, actually, you almost didn't get because you had just had a child. And they didn't think that you were skinny enough for the role, so you kind of went about it in an in an unconventional way. Yeah, again, me, I have to, you know, you have I to went after it. But you know, you have to, you have to with things that you want because nobody's going to hand you anything. So there's one of my favorite quotes, and it's um, obstacles are those things you see when you take your eye off the goal. And I yeah. never see the obstacle; I see the goal. And, That's a um, gift. <laughs> it is. It's a survival technique, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, you know, the casting director was absolutely right. I mean, I did not look right for the role. I, mm -hmm. one thing I do when I'm pregnant is eat. Yeah. That's all I do. That's all I do. I am not a good pregnant person. I'm not like those <laughs> you know, girls that run around in workout clothes and stuff. Oh, I wear a tent. Mm -hmm. I gain six pounds with each pregnancy. And I remember when the role was coming up for Kristen and my manager who had been my manager, he's been my manager like 20 years now, but what was it like maybe 10 at the time. So he knew me pretty well. Yeah. And he said, listen, there's something coming up on Bold and the Beautiful. So get your roots done and start moving. 
<laughs> oh, he goes, get your roots done, stop eating, and start moving. Start, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I would, you know, think he's a jerk, but he's right. Yeah. So I well, you know, of course you just had a baby, so your, your roots are going to be grown out, and yeah. Right. So I um I did the best I could, but yeah, I only had a couple weeks before that audition, and um, I, you know, they passed, and I understood, but mm -hmm. I just had the hardest time because it was just a timing thing. I knew I would lose the weight again, wow. and so what I did was <laughs> at the time on Young and the Restless, and so what I did was um, I asked her. I said, "Can you do me a favor?" Because the year before, I was on Sunset Beach. Yeah. And when I was on Sunset Beach, I got voted top 10 sexiest in soaps. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, I'll be that again. Yeah. So I sent that um, ad, whatever it was. Um, I forget what magazine. I don't think it's even around anymore. Um, and I sent that picture with a note that said, hey, I know you passed on me because of how I look right now, but I just had a baby. And wh whatever actress you're considering... Does she look as good as this? Because in yeah. two months, this is what I'll look like again. Yeah. I got the call back. That's that's amazing. I mean, and you did it because you just went after it and didn't sit back and say, okay, well, I'm I'm too overweight for this role, so something else will come along. So, But, yeah, you're perfect for that part. So. Yeah, I just, you know, it's, it's real tempting sometimes to just, you know, get in the fetal position and, you know, suck your thumb when <laughs> life beats you down. But. Right. Yeah, admit, admit defeat and just curl up and hide. Right. I, I heard a, somebody say one time that um, no is just my vitamins that empower yeah. me. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good saying. Well, I know your first scene was with Ron Moss and Hunter Tallow, so they kind of threw you in there with the big yeah. boys right away. So what was that like? You know, I my sister was always just a huge Hunter Tylo fan. She just has always been, you know, she's the prettiest person on the planet. You yeah. Know? yeah. And when I got my first script and saw it was with her, and, you know, plus, you know, I wasn't feeling real confident with my, I think I had 17 extra pounds at the time when I started. Right. And um, I was like, oh, my gosh. Not only am I just coming <laughs> pregnant, I'm with two of the most beautiful people. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, but, they're like the epitome of soap opera beauty, so. Hey, but, you know, the wardrobe people were great. And if you watch, like, my first episodes, I'm all in, like, long black, solid black and long sleeves. And so. Yeah. Had... Yeah, well, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty cool first scene, though. I mean, if you're going to join a show, I mean, yeah, it, dive in with both feet, so. It wasn't long before I was, you know, in scenes with Susan Flannery and. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, you tackled um, a big HIV story uh, storyline with Paolo Benedetti. Um, yeah. So, how challenging was that to take on? Um, you know what i I didn't find it challenging. I found it rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think for me, it's like exciting because it's something that has a message that has meaning it's not just gratuitous I'm you know mm -hmm. no kind of what's going on now like but I like him and you like him you know it's just all of yeah. the kind of high school type petty soap stuff it's right. not I find that storyline that we had was just um, real life and affirming and encouraging to other people and mm -hmm. I loved it and the adoption I love that we adopted Sandy. yeah yeah, well, that was definitely a memorable storyline. Obviously, I mean, I remembered it. I, that wasn't something I found in my research. I remembered watching it. So um, the fact that that I could remember it, you know, clearly the two of you did a good job with it and and presented it the way that it should have been presented. So thank you. Um, so do you keep in touch with any of your former castmates from the Bold and Beautiful? You know, the only ones. <laughs> I would say that I um, keep in touch with, um, well, from B&B &B would be Paulo. Paulo has been a great TV husband. He, yeah. Even when we weren't on the show for, I think, a three or four year spread there at all, I think every six months he reached out, hello, yeah. TV, he would say, how are you in the family? And, you know, yeah. he would 
messages or he just uh, kept that connection and the relationship was important to him, which I thought was really cool. And I didn't realize how cool it was until we were invited back after that length of time. And it was nice yeah. that it wasn't like we're, you know, trying to catch up and right, get to know each other again. Yeah. So yeah. he really kept that going. And then um, Windsor um, is somebody who's kept in touch and I've kept in touch. Even when my son, we were um, doing a hockey tournament in Vegas and he saw on Facebook or something that I was in Las Vegas and he was, he commutes back and forth there. I guess his dad lives there and he's like, you're in Vegas. And he came and watched one of my son's hockey games while we were there. And, um, and then Kelly, Catherine Kelly Lang, she and I both ride horses and yeah. we've gotten together and done that from time to time. Not, gosh, not in the last five years. Um, just because I wasn't riding as much when I had my second child, but, um, she actually recently brought a horse out to a trainer friend of mine that's right by my house, and we just keep in touch. Yeah, those are the yeah. only ones. But that, you know, that's really good, and it kind of speaks to the the family environment that we hear so much about. Uh, not only on soap operas, but just like the Young and the Restless and the Bold and Beautiful in particular, you always hear about it being like a, a large family environment. So that's kind of a testament to that. Well, you know what? It starts at the top, and I got to tell you a story. I remember when I, my first day on B and B, you know, my son was I think three months old when I started, mm -hmm. and the first time I'd left him alone at home, and um, I remember Brad Bell. He calls. I'm sure he does this with everybody. Calls and is like, "Hey, welcome to the show. And how's your first day going?" And I'm like, "Great." He goes, "Did you bring your your son?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "No." didn't. And I said, but I heard you guys are really cool about that and it's okay. And he goes, not only is it okay, we insist. Yeah. He said, my father told me a long time ago, you do not keep a mother from her children. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's amazing that, you know, how many bosses would do that. So. Yeah. So next thing I knew they're like, um, so somebody was asking me, well, what do you want in your room? Do you want a changing table, a crib? Do you, and I'm like, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> My mom was my nanny, so, um, you know, she'd come to work with me every day, and he was with me. He sat on my lap during hair and makeup, um, during rehearsals. He was there coloring on my script. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, well, your first soap opera role was, you know, The Young and the Restless, obviously, and then you were on Sunset Beach, which was unfortunately canceled, so that was... Yeah, you've done a lot of different soap operas. Yeah, um, I wish Sunset Beach. Would, sometimes I'm like, man, I wish Sunset Beach just stayed on and I was still at the same job. You yeah, know, it's just hard bouncing around. Yeah, I'm well, it's you know, it was a really good show, and I was kind of surprised when it was canceled. So, but yeah, you, know you know why it was canceled? No. Basically, Aaron Spelling, you know, he's got his. Once you get to his level mm -hmm. as a producer, it's a big cut of shows. So wow. Sunset Beach was doing really well. We were airing after The Tonight Show, and they were mm -hmm. starting to air overseas. Well, NBC was like, wait, we want a bigger piece of this pie. And uh. Aaron Spelling's a big piece of pie. Why don't we just wow. do our own show without Aaron Spelling? Yeah. It'll be in house. And they, you know, got greedy. Yeah. Basically. And unfortunately, I think Sunset Beach was really just starting to get its fan base. Yeah. And they would be better off with, I mean, of course, I'm making up figures, but, you know, 30% of something than 100% of nothing, which... Right, um, yeah. Yeah, well, it was, a, you know, like, a, you know, I thought that it had a huge fan base when it was on, at least after it was on for a while. So I was kind of surprised, you know, it's not typically something that gets canceled if there's a lot of people watching, so... I was just, you know, the presidents at... NBC at the time, the president of NBC at the time was, you know, just thinking he was trying to do right by his boss for his right. or his organization, whatever you call his network, right? And uh, try and find a way to make them more money. So. And it ruined everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I know at one point you auditioned for uh, General Hospital, and you didn't get the role, but that, that sort of helped you get into sh into shape anyway. But I am curious, what role was it that you were up for? 
you know what? I'm trying to remember, but I think it was that um, the Sarah Brown role. Um, Carly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I wondered about that because I thought, you know, she would have made a good Carly. So I wonder if that was the role that she was up for. Well, it was Carly. Yeah. I remember. I remember Sarah <laughs> Brown. It was, it was the during that time. I think it was when she got cast. Right. Yeah. And there's been a lot of Carly since then. So. <laughs> Not me though. <laughs> Not you, but you know, you never know. Um, well, the daytime Emmys are coming up, so do you still keep up with those? I don't. I'm not real good about that. You know, I, I try, I think one of the ways for me to stay sane in this business, and I, I think it'd be good for research, because if tomorrow my manager called and said, hey, there's an audition on this, it would be good to wow. go on on these shows, but just for my sanity, because I really enjoy it, and would like to be on another show at this point now that my youngest is in kindergarten and everything. Yeah. I think it's just for my sanity, I just can't, I, I just don't watch. Yeah. I'm just involved, you well, know. That makes, I, that makes sense. You know, you, you have to have boundaries, especially if you have a family, so I can understand why you wouldn't keep up with that. Yeah, um, I mean, I stay really busy with my other stuff and, um, you know, when once in a while on Twitter, like when people were going crazy about the Maya thing, I'm like, that's it. I'm recording it. I'm watching. And, right. you know, he's <laughs> in, in character screaming at my TV going, what are you, what? Get that picture out there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I want to talk I, about your, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I said that was all. I checked in and then I yeah. you know, checked out. Right. I take yeah. Well, I want to talk about your book for a few minutes. I know it came out several years ago, and I can't believe it took me this long to read it. But um, it seems appropriate to mention it, given this movie, Do You Believe, that comes out next week. Um, so first of all, what made you decide to write this book? You know what? I didn't go looking to write a book. I, um, I was a Christian living in Hollywood, and I got involved with this group called Movie Guide. And mm -hmm. Movie Guide organization that they review films for spiritually redemptive value so yeah. that you know if you're um, somebody who's trying to you know take your family to a movie but you want to make sure it's in line with your values uh -huh. you can go on we'll say you know what this is kind of a pagan theme this goes against what we believe or they say great spiritual value um, biblically sound all those kind of things anyway they also have an award show once a year where they um, give awards to you know, TV shows that had a good storyline that was faith-based and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to present awards a few times at these award shows. And I got to know Ted Bear, the president, pretty well. And one day he called me and he's like, hey, I have some people I want you to meet. So meet me at the Sheridan Universal and um, this day and time. And so I liked Ted and I was real behind what he was doing. So I'm like, sure, whatever you need. And I'm thinking I'm there doing him a favor. But it yeah. was the... Um, publishers from Broadman Holman who own like Lifeway bookstores which is a huge Christian bookstore chain and they you know they just write they they print things like Bibles you know? right. and I'm like oh my gosh and they just looked at me and they said Ted tells us he thinks you have a story in you that should be told yeah and well it, it was an amazing story well thank you yeah, it, it was, and I hope that everyone can try to find a copy of your book to read because it was inspiring and moving, and yeah, it was an amazing story. So um, tell us how you came up with the title. Well, that's kind of where I decided I needed to start when I was, you know, with this idea, and, you know, they said come up with the, you know, I think they call it log lines that were, they wanted to just kind of hear my pitch of what I would write about and everything, and so it was just, you know, me, dog after a bone again, you know, wow. it's all, like all thought of, it's like, well, what would I write her up? And what is, what is my message? What is my story? And, um, and I just felt like my whole life, it was like, I was pursuing Hollywood and attention and accolades from strangers, mm -hmm. including, and all of those things to fill this hole in my heart. And my the only time that hole was ever filled was when I filled it with God because it's a God's hole. Yeah. And you fill it with anything else, it doesn't fit. And um, so, I don't know, I was just driving down the street 
one day and all of a sudden it just came to me. It was like the Ten Commandments. I broke all the Ten Commandments trying to be holy. It's perfect ten. And I thought of Bo Derek and the ten, you know, that she was considered. And it just I don't know, it hit me one day. It came came through. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, it, but you had like such a difficult childhood. I know that you you went through a lot of different things. You were you and your one of your sisters were on your own for a while. Um, yeah, you were you were almost raped when you were twelve. You were raped when you were sixteen. Um, you had several bad relationships, and you were sort of manipulated or forced into having an abortion at one point, and then you almost died from that. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, how did your family feel about you writing this book? Because they weren't always portrayed in the most positive light, but this was your truth. This is what you went through. Yeah, it caused some issues at first, and, you know, but I think it, um, you know, monsters hide in the dark. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, the room's only scary when it's dark, you know, and you turn the light on it, and yeah, you're going to see what's in there, and you're going to see it might be messy, and you might find the cobwebs and the dust, and, you know, but but then you can clean those things. Now right. that you can see them, and they're not, then it's not so scary. And so it gave us, you know, an opportunity to to do some spring cleaning, so to speak, and, right. you know, deepen our relationship. I think my dad was the maddest. Mm -hmm. um, your biological dad. Yeah. He really, and I mean, honestly, up until about a year ago, he really came full circle. He yeah. kind of tried to, but there was always just a little bit that he, hostility was hanging on to. Maybe not hostility, but he still hadn't completely owned it. You know, it was always, it wasn't seven years, it was six and a half. You know, he's hung up on that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> Really? Technicalities, you know. You know, things like, and it wasn't exactly that, but I'm just giving an example. Right. It was just yeah. things like that. It, it wasn't Colorado. It was, uh, it, or it wasn't Denver. It was Littleton. And, yeah. And, hey, that's not the point. And I said, I'm sorry. I was, you know, 10 at the time. That's how I remember it. And you might be right, but it doesn't really change the narrative, you know. Right, exactly. So that was kind of hard, and he was still not fully taking responsibility until we had another fight about something totally different. Yeah. And he, he lives in Florida. He drove all the way here and he said, I just want to talk to you. And he and he got in the car, he got emotional, and he's like, I'm sorry. I was wrong, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think he expected me to, you know, go, yeah, and hammer out all the points. Mm -hmm. But I said, Thank you, Dad. Yeah. I where do you want to go well, to lunch? Yeah. <laughs> well, so ultimately the book was cathartic and it was healing. So, and, yeah. And, you know, I felt very led to do it. I mean, I was a new Christian when I wrote the book. Wow. Um, only been a believer a few years. Um, but I knew what I was hearing in church was all about be prepared to give your testimony whenever you're asked. Mm -hmm. And that is a Bible verse. And I'd heard that in church right before this opportunity. And, you know, usually that could be a one-on-one -on -one situation, but mm -hmm. I had an opportunity because of my career to tell my testimony to a lot of people, and I yeah. took some flack from so people. Um, yeah, I was I was going to ask you about that because Hollywood's not exactly known for being the most accepting toward the Christian value system. Yeah, I mean, I know that it has affected me. Um, I have more conservative values than a typical Hollywood person. I mean, I'm a Christian, and I'm married to a police officer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just am not uh, fit in that, you know, that whole image there, I guess. But um, And I know it's affected me, but it's okay. But then, I mean, even Christians had an issue with it. Christians were like, how can you be on a soap opera and call yourself a Christian? And, yeah. You know, it's, so you get, you get it. You can't, like, you know, then you learn you can't please everybody. You know? Right, and Exactly. I, I started realizing it, everything is about the audience of one, mm -hmm. that guy. So right, right, exactly. He's pleased, then I'm doing okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, I knew that your book came out when you were on The Bold and the Beautiful, so I wondered how your castmates received the book, if they were supportive or... You know what, it's kind of... I, I feel there was um, some sentiment, like 
not from anybody directly, but like I was doing it just to like promote myself. Like it was about self promotion. Yeah. No. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't get that from reading it. It it sounded like a true, sincere testimony. So. I appreciate. That. Yeah. And I, I hope that everyone, like I said, I hope everyone can find a copy. It is difficult to find now because it's been out for a while, but there are yeah, copies out there. <laughs> um, so um, I read that because of your Christian faith, and I love this because I've never heard anyone say this before, but that you will change words in your acting that um, require you to take God's name in vain, that sort of thing. Um, has anyone ever given you any difficulties over that? No, because you know what? I've learned my pastor is the coolest guy, and he comes up with stuff that's better than curse words. He's like, yeah. I don't give a rip. And I'm like, I love that. Yeah. And that, oh, bullfrog. You know, it's like, those yeah. are great. <laughs> right. Those are better. There's a, a, I forget what play it's from, but one of my favorite lines, a play I'd done in acting class, and her, um, I'm going to think of it after we're done here, which play it was, but she says, um, <laughs> profanity is the recourse of lesser minds. Yeah. And I love that because if you have a thesaurus, you can come up with all kinds of different words that have great impact without yeah. having to say, you know, using those same ones over and over. Right, exactly. Impact. But the big ones, you know, for me, I don't think, I don't think it's anti-Christian necessarily. Like if you stub your toe and swear, I don't think you're, oh. you know, I don't think God's going to, you know, strike you down with lightning for that. Right. But, um, it's just about trying to, you know, be clear. And it's for me too, with like having kids, it's almost like it, it just like doesn't feel good in my ears. It's like, it's just ugly to me when I hear yeah. swear words. It just sounds trashy to me. But the yeah. big ones, like if I really needed to swear in a script, I could, I could do that because I can see where that can draw, you know, further a story. Mm -hmm. I had to swear, but what I absolutely, the non-negotiable is like GD and right. given Jesus middle name, he doesn't have a middle right. name, mm -hmm. <laughs> <And it> does, <laughs> those kind of yeah. things, those are non-negotiables, but yeah, if I had to, you know, say a four letter word to the first storyline, I, I don't think that is, um, right. something, yeah. that's, not a, that's not a hill I'd die on. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good that you do that though, because you hear that a lot more, the GD and that sort of thing. So it's good that you've drawn the line and said, no, I absolutely will not say that. So yeah. I commend you for that. That's fair. That means disrespect. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that says don't say the F word. Don't say right. the S word. It's a sin. You know, there's nothing. Yeah. But taking the Lord's name in vain and blasphemy and that kind of thing. Right. It's one of the commandments. It. So <laughs> Honor. Yeah. <laughs> So what advice would you give to young women wanting to enter this business um, to avoid the pitfalls that come along with it and to stay on the right track and not get swayed by the, trying to be Hollywood's perfect 10? Um, I would say one thing that a director told me one time, and because I flat out got the feeling that the casting couch thing was coming, you know, it was just getting awkward. Yeah. Said, so tell me, is it true this whole thing about the casting couch? I've heard rumors about it, but is it yeah. true? Does that really happen? So I just kind of like made it like I was not directly asking him about our situation, but that thing. And, and he's like, we really want young girls to think it's true. Uh -huh. He goes, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm not going to risk my career for some young scarlet just so I can, you know, have yeah. a day or fun evening with her once, he's yeah. like, don't tell him. <laughs> and we became good friends because of that, because he respected yeah. that, respected him, and we, we became good friends. But I think that's one thing is don't be fooled or misled by that serpent type temptation. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is I started working more when I became a believer. Mm -hmm. When I was that who was willing to go out there and work so hard and like force it. I didn't mm -hmm. work, got a contract on a soap. So after I became a believer and because 
it, it's just like letting it into God's hands and mm -hmm. just trust and doing your part and trusting him to do your part. And if it's supposed to work out, it's great. It gave me yeah. the ability to go into the auditions without that desperation and yeah. also feeling all that pressure, like it's all up to me because it's mm -hmm. not. It's yeah. a lot of circumstances, luck, all of that stuff. All I can do is be as prepared as I can and yeah. let this rest work itself out. So it gave me more um, calmness in my auditions and helped me. Yeah. And and you talk about that a little in your book, too, that once you gave it up to God, you, you started getting more roles. Yeah. Um, and you weren't quite so desperate, like you said, to get them because you weren't trying to fill that hole anymore. Exactly. I didn't need all of that validation and approval from a casting director anymore. Mm -hmm. Just like yeah. acting, you know, yeah. just doing it and going inside a casting room was another chance to just act. It was just another chance to role play. Yeah. And I love it. Well, I know that you said in your book when you were younger and this was before you became a believer that you were you were asked, I think, in acting class to describe why you wanted to be an actor. And it was all very outward. It was all about proving yourself to people and sort of getting revenge for everyone who had been, you know, treated you poorly, that sort of thing. So how has how has your view of acting changed since becoming a Christian and growing so much as a person? Yeah, my original reasons were all about dysfunction. You know, mm -hmm. the whole, how do you like me now? And, um, yeah. You know, they'll be sorry when I'm famous and we're not friends. They'll wish I was friends when they, you know, yeah. all of those kind of things, which I think drive a lot of people into it. Um, yeah. And I almost thought when I became a believer that I needed to give it up because I knew that those were, you know, not good reasons to be doing it. So why am I doing it? And then yeah. when the thing came around and I said, aha, because it gives me a platform to make a difference in the world. And the movie guide thing, Ted Bear, again, what he's doing and um, trying to be light in Hollywood is so profoundly important um, mm -hmm. because so many kids, I mean, he's done research and I don't know the numbers, but it's like how much time kids spend in school versus how much time they spend in front of media, mm -hmm. how much their brain is getting affected by what they see in TV and film and music videos and all of those things that we have a responsibility to try and put good messages out and wow. positive things, you know? Yeah. And yeah. And if you've got the tools to do that and the platform to do it, there's no reason not to put good things out there in the world. There's enough bad things. So, uh, and that's why I love that the movie God's not dead did so well last year. Yeah. It really sent a message that, you don't have to have so many F words to get that R rating and, you know, I think people are going right. to see all these R rated movies and, um, you know, like Heaven is for Real and Soul Surfer and God's mm -hmm. Not Dead. God's Not Dead had a $2 million budget and made $65 yeah. million. Well, it was such a powerful movie. So, uh, you know, I think that the anticipation is bound to be high for this new movie that you're in, Do You Believe? Um, because that one did so well. Yeah, I think that... Um, I think pretty much, I would like to think people who went to see God's Not Dead will go and then yeah. hopefully bring a friend or two that didn't go <laughs> to this yeah. one. Is so, uh, Tim, in this the, this movie, this Do You Believe, stellar cast, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I think it's going to do really well. So tell me about the character that you play. Um, my character's named Grace, and I play Ted McGinley's wife, and he's the pastor um, in the film. And we've been married for 11 years, but we have not been blessed with a child. We've mm -hmm. been struggling with infertility issues and, um, or fertility issues. Yeah. And we kind of have it, you know, what I love about my character is it's becoming a believer doesn't mean you no longer have troubles and everything's hunky dory, yeah. you know, all of that. It just yeah. means you <laughs> go to a different place when it happens. You don't drink and do drugs, you, you know, find wow. encouragement ways but um anyway my character is kind of feeling a little betrayed by god and saying wait a minute my husband and i we devote our life to the church to you everything we do and you can't give us a kid you mm -hmm. know so she's in that place and struggling and um 
it's just nice. There's a big transformation on her faith and throughout. Yeah, well, I can't wait to see it. It it looks like it's going to be really good. You know, we watched the the trailer at the beginning of the interview, and yeah, there's there's several different versions of that trailer, and each one is is powerful. So, I think it's going to do really well. I hope so. I think it's a really good movie, and you know, they've done a lot of screenings, and it's gotten I think they said 95 percent positive feedback. So that's a good sign. Right. Yeah. Well, and and the fact that you know it's from the same people that created God's Not Dead, I think that that's going to draw people into the theaters because, you know, like we said, it did really well, so everyone enjoyed that movie. So. You've got a Not Dead started in 200 theaters. Yeah. And it ended up at 65. I mean, it's still making money, but I, I think box office was 65. Overseas yeah. did better than DVDs. But, um, and then with uh, Do You Believe, we're in, I think, almost 1,200 theaters to start. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I checked the list to see if my theater was on it, and it wasn't at first, but it is now, so hopefully I'll be able to, to get there and see it. So I don't even know what it's up to now. Maybe it's more, but yeah, they yeah. keep adding and, and so it's good. Yeah, I'm in Tennessee, and I was looking through the list, and I was like, there's no, nothing in Tennessee, and then finally it showed up. So, yeah, better I don't know. People are all in Tennessee. It better <laughs> show but, up. Yeah, I know. Um so it opens on March 20th, which is, that's your wedding anniversary, right? Yeah, you did good research. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> Been an easy I day to remember, so. Yeah, so do you think I should take my husband to a movie to watch me playing someone else's <laughs> wife? Yeah, that's a, that's a good anniversary date. I think you should, yeah, to the premiere of the movie. Um, yeah. Well, you've done quite a few of these faith-based movies, so do you hope after this to do even more? Oh, I would love to. Yeah, you know, um, I really enjoy this group of people a lot. And, um, yeah, I've done for a while. And then when the God's Not Dead was so successful, I was kind of like, are you kidding me? That's the one I don't do because I've worked with this group before. And right. I'm like, now make a big hit on the one. I had missed my audition for it. Somehow my agent, she said that my audition got stuck in her outbox and I never got it. Oh, until gosh. I before I was supposed to be there. And I live outside of L.A. I live about 50 miles outside of L.A. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, I just gotten out of Pilates class. I had my three-year-old son in the nursery there. I'm like, what? I can't read a script and get there in half an hour. It's just physically impossible. <laughs> so I tried to get in another day, and they had found um, – it was the role of Amy from God's Not Dead that I was yeah. supposed to audition for. And, um so when God's Not Dead was all over the place, I sent them an email. I'm like, way to rub it in. Jeez, I missed one audition. You make it a huge <laughs> And they said, actually, we're starting casting for the next one. And yeah. I'm like, yes. So lucky for me, the director liked me, and I was able to get in. Yeah. Well, this it looks like it's going to be a good movie. And like I said, there is a stellar cast. Mira Sorvino, Tim McGinley, Sybil Shepard. I mean, yeah, it's just majors and um, Alexa Penavega. She's yeah, she was one of the Spy Kids, and then Madison Peters. Do you know who she is? She was in that movie Game Plan. She's the yeah. curly black. Kid. Yeah, yeah. She's in the storyline, and um, she's on the Fosters now. I keep on to call them the Foresters. <laughs> the yeah, Fosters. <laughs> she's on the Fosters. Now. Yeah. So she's in it. Um, yeah, just a, a really. Ray, oh, J.J. Soraya, who, um, he was in um, that movie that just came out uh, with Kristen Stewart, Camp X-Ray. Oh, yeah. He was in Wives. He was in Army Wives. He's in it. Um, yeah. Uh, Mira Servino, though, was the one that I think was the most exciting, you know, because anybody's yeah. won an Academy Award, they kind of get <laughs> yeah. extra cool. It is really cool. So can you talk about uh, dad dudes yet? Which I know I'm going to end up calling do dads at some point. but <laughs> um, Dad dudes, yeah. Um, that was a, a group of guys that had a YouTube video that went viral. It had like 2 million hits. They were on all the morning talk shows because they were doing a spoof on how they are fathers and they're driving around in their minivans and their kids always want to put a movie on. Well, they're, they've heard the movie Frozen a dozen times, but they've never seen it. Yeah. So finally, they are like, we should watch it. And they go in the closet or whatever, and they start bawling. And they're, you know, they're like, <laughs> they make up this parody song, and it's a great video. Anyway, it was getting really good attention, and um, they decided, you know what? 
we should take these characters and make it a sitcom. And so they wrote a script and they shot a pilot for it. And we had Jerry Mathers played my father-in-law and Joyce Gerard, who's on Beverly Hills Housewives. Um, yeah. She played another one of the wives and it, it was really well written and really good. And I really hope it gets picked up. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, it sounded, it sounded like a great concept. So. Yeah, I think so. I think it's yeah. really well written and I, I think the pilot came out good. So. Yeah. Finger- yeah, well, I'll definitely keep my eye out for that. Um, you're also involved in several different charities, so would you you like to talk about those for a minute? Well, actually, I'm getting ready to do a run in two days. Well, I say run. It's a run walk for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, the only thing I run is behind. But um, anyway, it's a really good friend of my husband's, uh, who they worked on. My husband's a retired LAPD SWAT officer. And another LAPD SWAT officer was a reserve Marine who on his third tour was killed in Afghanistan. And that was coming up five years ago. And when he passed away, when he was deployed, his daughter was two months old and she is now five years old. But she was eight months old when he was killed, just before he was ready to come home. And we do a fundraiser every year for him, but through his passing, getting to know the charities that really stepped up, so, you know, uh-huh. sometimes with charity, you're like, yeah, it sounds good, but you've never been, like, on the receiving end to know if they're really putting the donations to right, where they need to be, yeah. Uh, so the charities that showed up for her, for the widow during that time, I really like to get behind and donate to them. And then um, this run walk that we do, um, get behind doing that every year, too. Yeah, well, that's really neat. Um, I know you've been in, involved with different things like Project Cuddle and um, horse rescue things and that sort Project, of thing. So, Project Cuddle was fun. I got to co-host one of their fundraising events with mm-hmm. John Stamos. Yeah, and, awesome. <laughs> and Catherine Kelly Lang was there. We did that together. Um, yeah. She was, she's like, I don't want to host. I don't want to talk or whatever. So I did that part. And she was, you know, don't. <laughs> bunch of stuff and got all our fans involved so yeah sounds really fun babies and I mean it just kills me that anybody can do anything to an innocent child yeah I know it's stuff happens all the time and it's just kind of blows your mind that that yeah. stuff exists in the world so there isn't evil a lot of people want to deny exists but being married to a there. aware yeah of a lot of it yeah it's there. Well, anything else that you would like to add before we sign off and tell people where to see the movie, that sort of thing? No, I just want to say you're a great interview. Oh, interview yeah, for... well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sorry, great. what? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sorry that you had so much trouble logging in, but like I said, you know, Every time some, something goes wrong like that, it ends up being a good interview, so I try not to worry about it too much. It all works out how it's supposed to. Right, exactly. Well, let's see. Okay, Do You Believe opens in select theaters March 20th next week, um, and you can check to see if it's playing in your area by going to doyoubelieve.com slash theaters. It'll give you a complete list of all the theaters that it's going to be playing in. Um, but and if it's not playing in your area and you would like to bring it to your area, you can purchase group tickets at moviegrouptickets.com slash do you believe. And Tracy's book, Breaking the Perfect Ten, is still available. It might be a little difficult to find, but I know that Amazon still has some new used versions, which is what I got. So it's it's pretty inexpensive and it's a great read. So be sure to check it out. So and thank also- you. Just uh, they can find me at, at Tracy Melchior on Twitter, right. which people have a hard time spelling that, but it yeah. it's on your page too. Right. And then on Facebook, Tracy Lindsay Melchior also. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I know I know you had quite a few interviews this week, so I'm sure you're kind of tired of talking about yourself, but I appreciate you coming on tonight. Six thirty this morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope this wasn't too painful. So. <laughs> Oh, this is easier than 6.30 in the morning. But. Yeah, Okay. Yeah. definitely. Okay, well, well, we'll sign off now, and I'll let you, you know, relax the rest of the night, so. 
Get some sleep. <laughs> Get some sleep. Okay. Good night, Tracy. And I hope you can come back at some point. So. I would love to. Yeah, hopefully I'll have something else to promote we can talk about. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I have a feeling that you're going to have a lot of things to promote in the future. So. Your lips to God's ears. Yeah. All right. Good night, Tracy. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you. You too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>